Writing is considered an art form, but there are some topics that can get you killed. We'll look at that next on Global Perspectives. This program was made possible by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office. Hello and welcome to the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Brucia, Special Assistant to the President for Global Perspectives at the University of Central Florida. Our guest today is Luis Alberto Urea, author of The Devil's Highway. Thank you for joining us today. Happy to be here. Tell us a little bit about your story, um, how you came to research this topic and... Uh, oh, well I, I, you know, I was born in Tijuana and uh, was in Tijuana till I was about five and then came to the United States. My mom was American, my dad was Mexican. And uh, I had worked uh, with relief workers on the border, you know, with street urchins and criminals and drug addicts, but mostly people in the Tijuana garbage dump and children in orphanages. And, um, you know, through some strange miracle, I, I was hired to teach expository writing at Harvard. And when I went to Harvard, I took all these journal notes about the garbage dumps. And I had this insane idea that if I wrote a book about the voiceless and non-represented, everybody would care. My mistake. Um, but I wrote that book and uh, took 10 years to publish it. But once it was published, it sort of established me as a kind of a border voice. Um, by happenstance, it turned out that I think many of the people who wrote about the border weren't really from the border. And I was as from the border as you could be. So it turned out to work out for me. So I had done a few books. And when the Devil's Highway story happened, it was the most catastrophic single death event in a long series of death events. I mean, the, the, the death numbers have been heinous for quite a long time, the Arizona-Mexican border. But this was the, the sort of one weekend death event uh, award winner. And it happened in May of 2001. Um, and I had done three border books and wasn't going to do more, but Little Brown contacted me and asked me to. And I thought one would be foolish not to, you know, take an invitation from Little Brown. So I started investigating that. And uh, what it, was the essence of the tragedy, just in a sentence or two, for people? Um, there were there were 26 men in Veracruz, and what was fascinating to me was that these men didn't have any plan regardless of what you hear on talk radio or whatever, uh, to invade the United States. They were men who were workers, small plot farmers, coffee sharecroppers, and economic downturns, including coffee prices, devastated their small economy out in Veracruz. And they were actually recruited by a criminal gang that went and recruited them and basically got them to make a financial arrangement they could not afford so that they unwittingly sold themselves into slavery. They were brought north, walked into the worst part of the Arizona desert by an inexperienced guide or coyote, and they got lost. And this fellow ended up taking all of their money and leaving them. And you know this horrible die-off happened. It was the uh, largest border patrol rescue operation in their history. Every vehicle in the Yuma, Welton, that part of Arizona sector went out. Um, they had 70 flat tires trying to get to these guys. It's just an amazing story. So that's, that was the genesis of it, how I, I came into it. And, and you decided that this obviously was compelling material for, for a book. And if you were going to write another book about right. I, I, I wasn't necessarily eager to write a fourth border book. One doesn't want to keep repeating oneself, but you know, um, at the time, the most popular books of nonfiction were what they call men in peril books in the trade, and you know those books quite well: *The Perfect Storm*, uh, *Into Thin Air*. You know these books that we give Dad on Father's Day or Christmas. You know where a bunch of he-men die a hideous death, and Dad gets very happy and reads the book. Um, and so uh, the idea was to create a Men in Peril book, this was a classic one, but that functioned like the Trojan horse and that most Americans, we realized, have no idea what's going on at the border. 
have no idea what's involved in law enforcement at the border. No idea of much of what that book ended up revealing. So I initially went to look and see if there was enough story to report on. And it turned out that everybody from top down, government people, Mexican government people, law enforcement people, medical people, missionaries, you name it, were so uh, upset by what had happened that they all wanted the story told. So I ended up getting this access that was astonishing. I didn't even know what I'd stumbled into when I started. More and more and more deeply revealed things. So, for example, one of the things I'm most proud about in the book is that it was the first time somebody had had the opportunity to reveal the criminal operation from the top all the way to the lowest employee and how it functioned, which was sort of a stepping stone to what we're seeing now with the narcos. Mm -hmm. well, this is the kind of work that could endanger one's health. Yes, I, I was told at least twice and implied a couple more times that I would be killed for doing the book. Not by bad guys, because they made themselves scarce, but warned by law enforcement people that it's the kind of project that could get one killed. Um, and, you know, honestly, that wasn't my intention. I, I'd rather stay home and garden and write some haiku, right, than get killed. But, um, and because this organization, like the Narcos, had tentacles all over the United States, here in Florida, they were coming to Florida. They were told they would get to pick oranges for one of the great growers. That's why they came. But they're in the Carolinas. They're certainly in the Chicago area, this, this group. And uh, I believe once or twice some henchmen of theirs have come to readings of mine. And it's been a very weird scene. Also, you know, Border Patrol guys show up, which is kind of a sweet scene. So, Because it really doesn't matter who you're talking to with, with this issue because everyone has some kind of stake. And, and I would imagine that none of them would trust you entirely because they're not quite sure what you're trying to do with it. Yeah, I think it, it, it was a really interesting situation in that because I have family in the Mexican government and a few of them well known, the consular corps opened their files to me where they wouldn't have done it normally. And it was a, like a series of tumblers. Once the consul in Tucson opened his archives. Then the consulate in Phoenix opened their archives. And once word got out that I was in Phoenix and they were showing me their secrets, then the federal defender of the coyote who abandoned the guy agreed to see me. And you know, at every turn, they look in your eye and talk to you for a little while and they decide they trust you. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, he gave me material. And, and it was just a series of those kind of events. And so, the hardest to get into was with the Border Patrol. They were the most suspicious. Um, curiously, the survivors of the event itself were involved in depositions and a, a group of lawsuits, so they were legally kept from me. I wasn't allowed to directly speak to them, though messages were passed sort of surreptitiously. Um, it was a very delicate negotiation to get all this story out. Um, but it, it, it ultimately worked. And I think, I think, you know, they look at what you've written, I think. They look into your eyes. They listen to what you have to say. It wasn't always welcoming. Mm. It wasn't always warm. Some of the Mexican officials were really harsh, um, but they gave in. But then there were times when, you know, you start to say, God loves me, <laughs> because things happen that you think, this is not possible. For example, uh, my brother in San Diego, my eldest brother, went to the Mexican consulate and, uh, in, in San Diego. And the consul recognized his name and said, Urea, are you related to the writer? I said, well, yeah, I am. It's my kid brother. And he said, oh, what's he, what's he doing now? Well, he's working on a book about the Yuma 14. And the guy said, the Yuma 14, my wife and I were the lead investigators for the government of the Yuma 14. And he said, where's your brother now? He said, well, he's in Chicago. And the guy says, Chicago? We've just been stationed in Chicago. <laughs> right? So then you think, well, the angels are on my side. I was going to say, somebody was smiling. On so me. they came to Chicago. I went to see him. They had, she had kept a diary of the whole investigation. She gave me her diary. Um, told me all kinds of stuff. You know, things like that. You start to feel like, you know, the universe wants the story told. So. 
Uh, well, when you first hear the story, you think, well, gosh, this is made for a book. And then you think, well, wait a minute, this is made for a movie. And it was almost made into a movie. But, you know, the, the, the situation in Hollywood is so odd that, you know, the, the uh, interestingly, I think the, the financial collapse that, or near collapse anyway, that we're living through was foretold partially in Hollywood, um, but also through the undocumented population in the United States. I knew it was coming well before it showed up because people from the World Bank, you know, the World Bank has a remittance money research wing. And I met some of them in uh, Santa Fe. And they told me before there was any trouble that remittance money from the United States to Mexico vanished. Something was coming and they didn't know what. It's an interesting sign, so. Mm. Early tsunami. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the tide was pulling out before it hit, I think. And, and movie money started drying up, so the Devil's Highway movie option ran out. But, you know, it's, it's never gone away and there's still interest in it, so we'll That's see. something that could happen. I, I, it might be happening, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, we're going to take a little break. And we'll be back shortly. Welcome back. We're speaking with Luis Alberto Urea. Tell us a little bit more about uh, some of your current projects. There's so many of them, John. <laughs> well, what would be, what's your favorite? <laughs> um, I'm finishing the sequel to The Hummingbird's Daughter right now. Um, it's, a, it's another uh, historical epic, and uh, I'm hoping to deliver it. It's only a year late, so. But you know, the first book took 20 years to research, so I think I've been moving expeditiously. Um, but uh, I'm turning that in in October, finished. Um, we have some film projects. I'm doing a lot of short story work lately and uh, about to start the next stage of research for a novel I'm planning about World War II based on the exploits of my mother and her Red Cross companions. The Donut dollies, making coffee and donuts for the troops under Pat. Tell us a little bit about that, if you'd like to, because uh, the, these are heroes. A lot of us may not. They know are about. heroes. They are heroes, and you know, I I, I uh, was really moved by all the Band of Brothers stuff that was happening in the Greatest Generation when I suddenly realized, wait, there was also a Band of Sisters. You know, there were women who experienced these things, and the donut dollies are specifically. Uh, fascinating to me because they weren't nurses they were many of them society ladies or just you know nice Midwestern women or, or, or whatever unmarried women many of them young women who went off to the war some of them thinking it was an adventure some of them as a lark some of them you know because they were involved with the Red Cross and my mother was one of them she went from high society New York to World War II and uh, they drove around in this club mobile, a big donut cooking truck. And she was on the front lines, you know, she was with Patton. They uh, stumbled into Buchenwald with the soldiers. They liberated Buchenwald, these donut cooking women. And uh, she was uh, on the front lines. She hid from panzer tanks and it's this unbelievable adventure, um, horrors and she was wounded and came back from the war wounded and left behind when she died uh, albums of photographs and notes and uh, journals and all these things that I did not have the wisdom to appreciate as a kid. And now that I'm an adult and a dad myself, you know, we were talking earlier about what it's like being a dad and how kids sort of discount you as the fuddy dud, you know, whatever, we're not hip. I, I was guilty of that too. And now I, I, I have this gold mine of story that she left behind. And I'm sure she despaired that anyone would ever pay attention. But, uh, you know, when I was a little boy, she had her war trunk and I was forbidden to go in the war trunk. So of course, one day when she was at work, I went in the war trunk and I found her photographs of Buchenwald 
piles of bodies and so forth. Yeah, it must have been, I don't know, third grade? I was a kid. And you can imagine I, I, trying to make sense of these pictures in my mom's stuff. What, what is this? And so she had to try to start explaining that to me when I was very small. Um, so now when I go through those, I mean, you know, that those photographs I, I want to donate to the Holocaust Museum or somewhere. I mean, they don't belong in our photo albums. They're important. But in, in those pictures, she has photographs that she liberated from uh, German officers' desks. So there's a snapshot of Adolf Hitler walking down a line of Nazi soldiers on inspection. Just crazy things. Um, but many of them have these notes on the back. And then she left these journals. So I'm piecing together the extent of her journey. You know, we know the village she stayed in next to a B-17 base in England. We know the pub she drank in. You know, my mother was in London when the first buzz bomb went over. She was taking a bath. So I started realizing this is an American epic um, and a story not told. There are very few Donut Dolly books, most of them self-printed. Um, and a lot of the stuff around them is gone. Though San, uh, Louisiana, New Orleans, has one of the club mobiles mm -hmm. in the World War II Museum. So my wife and I are going to go down there so we can lay hands on the real thing. Because otherwise it's just pictures. I was going to say, it seems like the research challenge here will be it's huge. huge. And so this could take a few years. Yeah, it probably could. I'm, you know, but w we went to England for a month this summer. Uh, you know, we went to some of her locations, spoke to people who survived the Blitz, you know, lived in a flat we rented, which is going to be the model for the flat she lived in in, in West London. So it was, it was very productive as well as fun. Fascinating. Let's go back to the border okay. discussion again right. because I, I'm, I'm thinking, considering the way the situation was when you first went in, you have a lot of skeptics. And then you write the book, and all of a sudden you, you've helped elevate thinking about this issue you know, across the board. And all of a sudden, I would imagine doors are starting to open. People are wanting to take advantage of your experience for perhaps teaching purposes. Yeah, it's, uh, it, was, it was a remarkable sea change, what happened you know, when Devil's Highway came out. And, uh, I, uh, I tour a lot, I speak a lot about these issues, and I have to tell audiences, you know, I'm not a political scientist, I'm not a sociologist, I'm a writer. I started out writing poetry. I'm, I'm a citizen trying to figure this out like you are. But I'm lucky in that I'm given lots of information by people in the know because they now trust me. Um, you know, and I experience a lot of things in the field that most people don't get to do. So in that case, yeah, I, I do a lot of talking. Um, I do a lot of teaching. I do a lot of touring. Uh, I get to do writing about it. You know, I think in some ways maybe the Donut Dollies is my escape from the border, <laughs> you know. But even with the Border Patrol, is, is, is there some educational function? You, <laughs> yeah, you know, you the have? Border Patrol, I mean, they were tough and uh, distrustful. And a few of those agents and I ended up being really good friends. And if I dare say, even a lot of love between us. Um, and also the, the, the sheriff of Yuma, Sheriff Ogden, one of my heroes, ended up being a pal of mine. And um, you know, when they realized, one of the agents said, we don't care what you say in your book, if you like us or hate us, what we do care is that you tell the truth. Nobody tells the truth about us. And they feel besieged. They're conservative guys who are ridiculed and assaulted by the right. And they're deeply suspicious of the liberals. So they're in this little world where everybody, you know, is, is singling them out all the time. So all they wanted was a fair shake. They wanted to know that I would honor what they showed me. And I tried to do that. And I think they were so stunned that that happened. I was too, you know. Um, that they, they've taught it at the academy on and off. And uh, I hear from agents all the time. I meet new agents all the time. Um, it's one of my deepest pleasures. Uh, you know, I do the Tucson Book Festival every year. And invariably, you'll see a very neat, short-haired fella in the line. And they're very circumspect. You know, they'll come up 
and they'll lean over and they'll say, U.S. Border Patrol, you know, and I sign their book. And, you know, it's, it's really nice. Um, this last time I was there, there were uh, yaki people from the reservation at the front of the line, undocumented people in the middle of the line, and Border Patrol at the back of the line. <laughs> and I thought, wow, here's the Southwest in one line, you know. Really interesting. When, when you research something, are you ever tempted, as some writers do, to um, play the part of one of the characters you're going to be describing in the, mm. in the short story of the book, just to get a taste of what it's like? Yeah, I think, yeah, writing fiction, certainly, I think, um, you know, at Harvard, they used to teach that all fiction is actually performance on some level, and I think that's partially true. Um, so if you write, certainly in the first person, it's the closest you can come, I think, to acting, because you're actually playing that person. But, uh, you know, I, it was, it, in the nonfiction, I try not to, though I try to, I try to sympathize as best I can. It's important to try to get under their skin so that they're alive and real. I know some of the writers in our audience will want to know your heroes in terms of, of the writing world. Uh, you so know, many. Maybe early inspiration and then inspiration now? Well, you know, my, when I was a kid, probably the first writer that made me go out of my mind with story and wanting to do it is Ray Bradbury, I would say. I just, when I, when I you know, I had gone through Kipling and Twain and all that stuff because my mom pushed reading on me, but when I found Bradbury, that was on my own. Mm -hmm and it made me go crazy. Ray Bradbury all the way. Over the years, you know, many, many writers. I, I, I loved Edward Abbey for his snarkiness. You know, of course, all the Latin Americans, but I didn't know about them until college. When I grew up, you know, we didn't even think there were great Spanish-speaking authors. We had no idea. When I got to college and I thought, what do you mean, Juan Rulfo, Neruda? What, what are you talking about? Garcia Marquez, all these guys, you know, Borges, what? <laughs> it was a shocker to me. So there was a phase of that. And uh, also I think w one of the really strong influences on me is Asian writers, Asian and Japanese poets, the haiku poets like Basho and Isa, Busan, those people, very uh, present in my, in my work. What do you read purely for fun? Oh, detectives, man. Hard-boiled detectives is what I read for fun. Um, but uh, right now I'm rereading Lonesome Dove just because it makes me so happy. I read lots of poetry lots of poetry so um, you know you're almost always going to catch me reading I don't know James Lee Burke or some poetry pretty much do you also read in in the news media mm. yeah absolutely I know some like to to separate themselves no from that I'm, I'm married to a reporter okay so you have so no choice investigative <laughs> reporter we you know all day long with the CNN or MSNBC and you know, reading the New York Times every morning, and I've got a uh, couple of newspapers on the uh, iPhone, and I, I'm a news junkie, so. Well, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And thank you. For the Global Perspective Show, I'm John Garcia. We'll see you next time. This program was made possible by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office.